heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full coverage on Guess What? NVIDIA. You know it, pushing ahead to that all-important earnings after the closing bell. Plus, Apple looks to get its DOJ antitrust case tossed out. We'll bring you the details. And Scale AI secures $1 billion in funding as its valuation nearly doubles to almost $14 billion. CEO Alexander Wang is going to be joining us later in the hour. But first, and let's check in on these markets because there's a macro bit of data we're waiting for. The Fed minutes coming a little bit later in the afternoon. And we're basically flat ahead of that. We're still digesting some really strong earnings that have come from the tech ecosystem. We brace for what NVIDIA brings us and we're up just five points on the Nasdaq. But remember, new record highs after record highs. We're looking at a 20-year yield just flat ahead of an all-important auction. We had seen bonds selling off, yields rising. Now we managed to go back into the green just a moment. Pound, I look at, because inflation, yes, it is cooling, but it is not cooling as much as the market wanted to see. The pound is higher events as the U.S. dollar, as potentially we see the Bank of England not being able to cut at the anticipated rate that the market had wanted to see. Let's move on and see what's happening in the world of crypto, because suddenly, out of nowhere, we regalvanize ourselves, potentially the latest spot ETF, this one being an ETH, an Ethereum-related one. Thoughts and prayers to all those who are the lawyers or the compliance folks having to get the data, having to get the documents ready. We're currently down by a tenth of a percent on ETH as we speak. But, Ed, what are you watching? It has been called the mother of all earnings. It's been labelled as the single most important stock on the planet, and that when you say AI industry, you are talking about NVIDIA. NVIDIA reports earnings after the bell. The stakes are incredibly high, and we want to continue to see year-on-year top-line growth in excess of 200%. Um, I also look at the market capitalization of this company when you think about how high the stakes are. Uh, it's a lot, right? And so... What's going to happen? I know a lot of you in our Bloomberg Technology audience look at demand signals. You look at the commentary from the hyperscalers. You look at all the news stories about the AI startups training models, whether or not they secured H100 clusters. And you look at some of the sovereign AI discussion that's happening. Um, there is a lot at stake, Caro. We're very excited about it. The expectation, though, is probably that NVIDIA and Jensen knock it out of the park. Yeah. And how often do you get to see 200% increases in a quarterly revenue? It ain't much. Let's talk about NVIDIA now reporting earnings after that bell. And here's what NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang had to say about his outlook for AI just earlier this week with you, Ed. We've re-engineered and reinvented every layer of computing from the chip to the operating system, to the system servers, to the way that these data centers are put together. We want to bring this generative AI capability to every company in the world. From the man himself to the other key voice we want to bring on right now, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst Mandeep Singh, because there is a lot of hope and market valuation riding on these set of numbers. Yeah, look, I, I think they probably will guide to $25 billion in data center revenue because that's what everyone cares about right now, and it's higher than consensus. So, you know, the buy-side bogey here is higher than consensus. Anything in line with consensus would have a negative knee-jerk reaction. And, and they'll do it. The question to me is how much of their uh, new Blackwell chip is used for training? Mm -hmm. And then what are the existing chips uh, in terms of, you know, the inferencing side of the equation? Because once you parse through that lens, you will get a sense of, you know, is this sustainable in terms of triple digit growth? Probably that's not going to happen given the comps get tougher in the second half. But in terms of sustaining high double digit growth, it comes down to whether NVIDIA will be a big player in, in, in inferencing. And last quarter, Jensen said they have a 40% share in inferencing. Everyone questions that, so yeah. we will be looking for update around inferencing because look, Microsoft announced a new PC with Qualcomm chip. Intel is probably doing something around uh, their own chip. Apple will announce something uh, around on-device Gen AI. That's all inferencing. So NVIDIA having inferencing share it comes down to do they have a play with the hyperscale cloud vendors, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google? 
using NVIDIA for inferencing? And the answer is they'll probably end up using their own chips for inferencing. Why would they use NVIDIA for inferencing given the ASP's, uh, you know, NVIDIA commands so expensive. right now? Yeah. Uh, Mandeep, I, I appreciate that answer so much. I've been thinking a lot about generations of technology. So all of this was built on H100, right? And a lot of people worry there's this air pocket where H200, the next generation with high bandwidth memory, is ramping up, and then you have Blackwell later in the year. You're an analyst that looks at this company. Are you concerned that the end market say, why would I buy H100? Like, the next best thing's coming, I'll just wait. I mean, uh, there were rumors around that with Amazon yesterday. But look, right now the market is undersupplied. And everyone wants to get a hold of whatever they can for training their LLMs. It, it, it comes down to who are the big LLM players. And we know that field is consolidating. A number of them have actually thrown in the towel. They're getting acquired by larger uh, you know, hyperscalers. So that field is narrowing. The second uh, vector that drives that is the size of the model. If the size of the model is growing, then you need more uh, a bigger cluster. And probably a H200 or a Blackwell series will have more performance. In fact, Google said their TPU 6 is five times faster than their TPU 5. Mm -hmm. What does it tell you that you know the performance increases are there? And uh, if you're a hyperscaler that's buying $10 billion of NVIDIA chips, you would want to see that higher performance chip as opposed to you know, the last generation. So all that is a risk. I mean, in the end, NVIDIA has a 50% you know, exposure to hyperscalers. And these are very concentrated customers, five to six customers making up 50% of their data center revenue. They've still got some dependency on China. China can't have the most sophisticated chips. Will we hear anything about exposure there? I mean, we know that's going down. It's almost mid-single digit of their revenue. But that's a market where they could have seen an upside surprises. Every company in China is training their own LLMs. Again, it comes down to training market. How big is the training market and how many players are there? I would say, you know, the top six LLMs are based out of United States. And then the next five are in China. But if uh, NVIDIA can't sell their latest chips to the China market, that kind of takes uh, some of the upside out, at least in the near term. And we don't know how this geopolitical situation will pan out. Uh, this is a really big finale to what has been an incredible earnings season. NVIDIA off the bell and Bloomberg Intelligence senior analyst Mandeep Singh. Great setup for us. Uh, coming up on the program, we're going to talk about optimism in the crypto industry amid signs of Ether ETF approval. Look who we've got, Jack Mallers, Strike CEO, on set, New York City. Caro, what are you looking at? Just having a keen eye on what else is reporting after the bell, Ed. Snowflake. Shares actually up about half a percentage point, but there has been anxiety that revenue growth for this particular software business is expected to slow to 26% from 48% last year. It says companies look prioritize, of course, generative AI over traditional da data warehousing, but where does that competitive landscape evolve for Snowflake? We wait to see if revenue can indeed hit the $786 million anticipated. This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, so I'm looking at Ether, and there's been a lot of energy in Ether over the last five days, just like Bitcoin trading 24-7. Bloomberg reported, citing sources, that the SEC had instructed the New York Stock Exchange and the CBOE to update regulatory filings, basically, that relate to uh, changing rules that would make the approval of a spot Ether ETF uh, more likely. And the market kind of got caught by surprise. It's as if, as if it wasn't priced in. And like Caro said at the top of the show, you've got compliance officers and chief legal officers everywhere going, wait, this isn't supposed to happen this quickly. And we learned from our Bitcoin experience, it ain't linear. Um, it, it doesn't go in a straight line. But people are now excited about it. And you look at the performance of the two, right? Uh, Ether, uh, tokenized version of the, the Ethereum blockchain, the kind of underpinnings of this industry, the gap's closing with Bitcoin a little bit. And Cara, I guess the point I'm making is that the market's kind of surprised. And I guess you and I might be a bit surprised that we're talking about this in this context and looking at the chart behind me. Tell you what many people feel really moved the market was actually Bloomberg Intelligence, Eric Baltunas, raising his probability that 
the B spot ETH ETF was going to come, and the market moved on that. Amazing. Well, we're going to talk about someone who's really into the Bitcoin scene and what he thinks about the Ethereum ETF as well. Strike CEO Jack Manners, always great to have you on the show. Thanks, Thanks for coming for in to the me. studio. You, of course, very much focused on functionality and building upon Bitcoin. What do you think, though, of a ETF yet more institutional money potentially coming into the smart contract side of the equation? Yeah, I'm not a fan of any other cryptocurrency outside of Bitcoin, but I think there is a hilarious story as to why this is happening. I mean, I was laughing out loud. It looks like someone went to Gary Gensler and said, hey, buddy, you're not in charge anymore. And you'd have to think why that was. It's because banks and Wall Street are making money, right? I, banks get a really bad deal in today's market is they have to buy bonds that are performing awfully. And all of a sudden, they get a free market in this independent crypto thing and they're actually making money these markets have life these markets go up when governments debase their currency these things perform well and they got a taste of bitcoin and it was the best performing product that they've ever had and they're like oh man how many other pieces of crap are there out there that we can list as etfs and i literally think that's what's happening it's a way better business to launch crypto etfs than it is to buy bonds right now uh, based on the macro environment. So I think someone said, hey, Gary, sorry, buddy. Uh, despite you thinking that these things are securities, we need to make money. And that's what happened. Well, it's funny that you bring up Gary Gensler because, of course, the House of Representatives are currently taking on a bill at the moment as to whether it should be the SEC at all overseeing crypto products more generally or whether it should be shifted. But to your point, whether or not Ethereum does indeed manage to become spot traded with an ETF and money coming in, there's a real organization of some of the documents because they don't want to see staking involved in any way. How do you think about what that means for an investment opportunity? I, listen, I, again, I'm a Bitcoin guy. I think all of this is a distraction and a load and nonsense. I think what they're trying to do is walk the fine line of how can we justify banks and Wall Street making more revenue on this industry? Because with all passive investing and central banks really trying to price control everything, this market has life. And if it has life, it means there's an opportunity to make money. Volatility is a good thing. People on Wall Street like volatility. So they're trying to find a way to justify and make happy and peace with existing securities laws while giving these Wall Street and these big banks like JP Morgan an ability to monetize this space and actually make money because the business they're in right now is, is awful. I mean, you're, you're needing to buy bonds, lend money to the government, and not get paid the growth that they're that Equities they're have been doing quite well. I mean, there are certain parts of the I get your point, though. Financial institutions have still been doing quite well in the rest of the markets, but there's yeah, potentially but, a role for banks to play here, which could also be going through regular. Yeah, but I, I think, listen, the, the S&P 500 is dominated by what? Like the top seven companies, and they're all tech companies. Tech companies don't care about the cost of capital. They don't need business loans. Facebook, Apple, these companies can finance their business with their existing cash flows. And so the rest of the world is in a pain of hurt. And banks right now, their whole job is to take our deposits and buy bonds. And these bonds are getting slaughtered. And all of a sudden, they're like, wow, here's a market with life. Here's a market with retail flows. Here's a market that has volatility and that is actually reactive to the outside world. Hey, how many of these crypto things exist? Hey, Gary, accept them all. So I wouldn't be surprised if we got a Shubaduki coin. What did I say on here? We should get a Shubaduki ETF soon. Seriously, I really think they're going to try and Jack. monetize it. Jack, uh, let's go back to basics here. There will be members of the Bloomberg Technology audience that push back on, I'm paraphrasing, a spot ETH ETF being the next listing of a piece of crap. <laughs> There's a standard tagline in our Bloomberg cover coverage, which is that Ether is a native token of Ethereum, mm -hmm. and Ethereum is the most widely commercially used blockchain. What would be your response to that standard line? Sure. OK. And, and I, I apologize to all those I offended. Here's my point. Bitcoin is the only money within the cryptocurrency space. It's designed and treated as a monetary asset. So then what do I think Ethereum is? I think Ethereum is a technology, which you actually just displayed in your introduction and definition of it. Ethereum appeals to developers. They change the monetary policy and the rules all of the time. However, the market often conflates it as a money, conflates it as a commodity. Strike is a technology. NVIDIA is a technology. These things are regulated by the SEC. These things have cash flows. These things have founders, directors, people that set the roadmap. And so when I say a piece of crap, maybe I'm being a bit aggressive, but I think it's distinctly different 
from Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin can be the world reserve asset, the one money that we use to store our time and energy. And I think Ethereum can be a technology which competes with NVIDIA, but then it gets confusing. It's like, well, what's their cash flows? Who founded it? Who sets the direction? Why does it change so much? And when it ch does change, why does it change? I think that there's a lot of intentional confusion going on in the story. And as a Bitcoiner, it frustrates me because I'm trying to fix the money, fix the world. And so I think that there's a lot the market has to sort out as to what it actually is and how to value it. Jack Manners, come back with your messaging and come on the show from San Francisco as well. Strike CEO Jack Manners on all things crypto. Meanwhile, we do have some breaking news coming from the UK. There has been a lot of rumors swirling about whether or not we'll see a summer election called by Rishi Sunak the current prime minister. UK Sunak will call a summer election this afternoon. That's being reported by The Guardian. He is going to call that election for July, so The Guardian reports. Now, thus far, Bloomberg has been reporting that there has been repeated affirmation that there will be an election in 2024 in the second half of the year. The nuance is exactly when that second half is. We'll have more for you on what's happening in the UK as well and the impact on UK assets. For now, this is Bloomberg Technology. Politics news out of the United Kingdom. Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, likely to call an election for as soon as July, as being reported by The Guardian. Now, we know that there has been plenty of rumours, particularly accentuated by the inflation report that came out of the UK today, which showed, even though it was higher than the market had anticipated, inflation is slowing closer to where the Bank of England's key rate of 2% level target is. Ed, this is notable because there has been much frustration with the way in which Rishi Sunak, leader of the Conservative Party, Prime Minister of the UK, has been able to inject or not the economic recovery into over the UK. The Labour, the con alternative party in the UK, leads by many points in terms of how perhaps voters would lean. And notable that he wants to, ex well, accelerate any sort of putting them to the polls. Well, according to The Guardian's reporting, July would be sooner than the sort of general wisdom, which it was that Prime Minister Sunak would wait until the autumn. His consistent line has been that there would be a vote in the second half of the year. But the rationale or thinking that he'd wait to the autumn is that there is a cost of living crisis in the United Kingdom, basically. And strategically, he and the Conservative Party, the thinking was, would hold until the autumn to let that cost, uh, uh, cost of living crisis dissipate somewhat, ease off, and then have more favourable environment. But you're completely right that if you go off the polls, which one always approaches with caution, uh, then the Conservatives do lead, uh, trail the opposition Labour Party. We can go out to Lizzie Burden, who's over in the United Kingdom, covering the political storytelling there. And at the moment, Lizzie, it looks as though The Guardian is giving us a month at least that we could see a general election. It's being cited by some senior, those close to Rishi Sunak himself. Indeed, I'm at Downing Street. The protesters are out, as they always are, on days like these. It takes you back to 2022 when Boris Johnson stood down and uh, Rishi Sunak came in, Liz Truss somewhere in between that. But look, all day, Rishi Sunak has had the opportunity to deny that he's going to call a July election. He's had ample opportunity and he's rejected every chance. Cabinet is ongoing. Currently, he's meeting with his minister and has been for the past 20 minutes. The Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, put short a trip to Albania. He was only on the ground for about two hours. And the Defence Secretary, Grant Schatz, the Baltic states for a NATO meeting. Yes, so, all Lizzie. All have been pointing to a big announcement, and here we have the Guardian. Yeah, Lizzie, meeting. sorry to, sorry to interrupt you here. We're getting... Lizzie, give me a second here. We're getting some more headlines on the Bloomberg Terminal. This time, Sky News reporting that a UK general election will be on July 4th, a more specific date than The Guardian was giving. We now have two reports from two different UK outlets or news organisations that 
there will be a general election in July. Uh, I want to bring in Vonnie Quinn and talk a little bit more about the, the UK economy here, Vonnie, because this is an issue of timing and strategy. July is sooner than expected, and it's sooner than expected because Rishi Sunak faces a difficult domestic uh, e economic picture that will inform voters' minds. Exactly, Ed. Well, let's talk about that inflation data that came in earlier, coming in at 5.3%, which was higher than most analysts and economists were anticipating. Services inflation... 2.3. Oh, 2.3. Services inflation at 5.9%, which really shows that inflation is entrenched. Rishi Sunak would have been hoping for that to come down and for there to have been a few more months of data showing better inflation figures. He's not getting that. Interestingly, the Bank of England, which had been expected to maybe make a cut in June, June. Banks have been pushing their estimates for that first cut out. In fact, just the most recent bank to do that was Goldman Sachs, saying that's most likely August. Now, for there to be a snap election, that makes life a lot easier, right? Because if there were to be a snap election in July, as some outlets are reporting, that would mean that June would be a very contentious time to make a rate cut. If the cut isn't going to happen anyway, as most banks are now anticipating. Well, that makes it maybe easier to get an election out of the way. However, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has a difficult job in that position then, because if he's not going to be the Chancellor anymore, then it falls to possibly Labour's Rachel Reeves. That's the person that markets are anticipating would enter number 11 in the event of a snap election with a better Labour result. And then it's her bag, right? And the IMF, as we know, has been calling for rate cuts this year and more next year, trying to bring the that rate, that bank rate, all the way down to about 3.5% by the end of 2025 in order to relieve this cost of living crisis, which is ongoing now three years, Ed. And let's just talk about Rachel Reeves, who, of course, is the shadow chancellor, meaning she's in the opposition party of Labour, Labour led by Sir Keir Starmer, and they have been well ahead in terms of the polls thus far, and the Labour leader has indeed been recently launching his six pledges, first steps to guiding the UK going forward. And it's not just all about the here and now of inflation, it's a lot about healthcare, access to NHS waiting lists, and of course that comes down to funding, Vonnie. More broadly, would it be the viewpoint from the economy here that Labour would in any way change the trajectory? Well, changing the trajectory is one thing. Promises are another thing, Caroline. So for sure, Rachel Reeves has constantly said that she would increase government spending in order to help along the lines of health care, national insurance and pensions in particular, which is going to be a very contentious issue for the next chancellor. That said, the IMF has said you can't do it. You can neither decrease taxes nor increase government spending. The economy won't be able to take it. You are risking growth. And remember, the UK just came out of recession in the first quarter. It grew 0.6%, yeah. and that was a big relief to the authorities. But that could be in jeopardy if there were to be more spending, at least according to the IMF. Bonnie Quinn there with the latest. Just to remind you, reporting coming from Sky News that the UK general election will be held on July 4th, anticipation of an announcement from the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak coming later this afternoon. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. And Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's check in on these markets because there is a wait and see feel to the broader indexes today. We've hit record high after record high on the S&P, on the Dow and indeed on our trusted tech benchmarks. I'm looking at the Nasdaq 100 currently holding on to gains up two tenths of percent as the all important set of numbers come out after the bell. NVIDIA key to market capitalization, key to the optimism around AI for the rest of the benchmarks. I'm looking at what's happening with the US 10 year yield basically trading flat. Remember, we've got a big 20 year auction and also Fed minutes coming to really pass through for the market. That's at lunchtime. ETH basically up about a tenth of a percent. That's as we do potentially anticipate yet another spot ETF, this one linked to Ethereum. We'll see if that continues. Let's move on and have a look at what's happening from a macro perspective across the pond. Great British Pound currently still holding on to gains. Why was it up versus the US dollar? Because the CPI print, the consumer price index coming in, actually hotter than was anticipated. Yes, it's down from an excess of 3%, but 2.3% was more than the market wanted to see for anticipating some sort of Bank of England rate cut. So the pound is up on some macro data, but there's also the points that are being driven home from a political perspective that we could see a general election held as soon as July 4th, currently being reported by Sky News Ed. We'll have more on that in a minute. But what have we got on the tech? Uh, another 
top story on the BloombergTerminal.com is Apple. It plans to ask a court to throw out the DOJ's case against the iPhone maker, making a long-shot bid to ward off what promises to be a lengthy legal battle. Joining us, Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst Anurag Rana. You know, this is a case followed closely, largely procedural update, but Apple saying, this is what we believe, help us out. How do you price that, Anurag? Yeah, I think this is one of the more important things and people don't talk about it because frankly speaking, you know, services revenue, as you know, is the one that's driving Apple's growth right now. And a large portion of that is the App Store revenue. And if there are things that will be done to damage that, um, and it's going to have an impact on Apple. So far, we haven't seen it because right now it's only a little bit changes in the EU. But any changes in the U.S. Uh, could, you know, could could have a material impact on that number. So I think um, Apple will do whatever it can to protect its ecosystem. And uh, I, as you said, it's going to be a, le a lengthy legal battle. Yeah, we're not on how it seems as though it is rare for these sorts of things to be thrown out at the behest of certain companies, even though we did see Meta indeed manage to persuade on that FTC focus previously. But Anurag, more broadly, is Apple doing enough to change the tune when it comes to AI, for example? We've actually seen shares do particularly well post earnings. Yeah, I think I, I, you know, I would give a little bit of that credit to, to Mark Gurman for breaking news on you know, their partnership with OpenAI or potential partnership with OpenAI and the ongoing talks that they have with even Google. So you know, one of the things we, I think it's, it's pretty, most people will agree that Apple's not been at the forefront of uh, any new Gen AI developments. So the question is, well, what are they going to do when, they, when uh, they have to, when, when the June 10th event comes in? If they are going to announce a partnership with OpenAI, with, with Google, that can help them to change their software, make it a little bit better, and based on that, we see a refresh uh, cycle improve for the iPhone. I think it's going to be good for Apple. Mm. Uh, so I think, I think it, is, it is going in the right direction, but we have a long way to go before we can say that uh, they, have a, they have a good position in that market. Anurag Rana, we always appreciate it. Coming from Boston, Bloomberg Intelligence. Meanwhile, let's focus in on where companies are driving forward with AI. Salesforce launching Einstein Copilot for merchants and for marketers to help companies basically personalize customer engagement across marketing, commerce, sales, services. All thanks, of course, generative AI. Let's bring in Salesforce AI CEO, Clara Shee, who is traveling around post the VivaTech conference in Paris. And I'm really interested as to what you're setting forth here, Clara. How are you trying to pit yourself against the competition of being able to, for your clients to use their own data in a more sophisticated manner? Uh, thank you so much for having me. First of all, we are thrilled to be hosting our Salesforce Connections event this week in Chicago um, for commerce merchants and marketers. And to be announcing just amazing innovation around Einstein Copilot as well as Einstein personalization and now data cloud for commerce. I mean, if you think about it, Caroline, you know, for the last 25 years, customers have been bringing their trusted data to Salesforce and building their campaigns, their transaction data, all of their business logic in Salesforce. And now they can unlock that data through AI. And it's very different than you know, going to ChatGPT, uh, going to another AI system that may not be secure, that may not have their trusted data, and getting results that may not make sense for their business versus one that's completely grounded in their organization's data and processes. Uh, Clara, hey, it's Ed in San Francisco. I I'm really interested in the co-pilot for merchants, right? We seem to be increasingly moving toward basically the AI agent, where the human being or several human beings interact with this agent just in the normal course of their roles. How quickly do you see the adoption happening and where is it happening? Well, it's just amazing to see the response so far for Einstein Copilot in both sales and in customer service. And, you know, for merchants and marketers, it's going to be equally powerful. What we're seeing is that, you know, AI is able to augment employees. And, you know, think about a commerce manager that has to set up a digital storefront or wants to launch a personalized commerce campaign. Now they're able to do so with the help of, of this powerful co-pilot that has all of their inventory data, that understands all of the best practices and is able to personalize to that specific customer their transaction history and their preferences. Clara, it's really interesting that you brought up ChatGPT 
as the potential of what someone else could be typing into. Because ultimately, Einstein GBT, correct me if I'm wrong, is a mixture of public and private AI models, and you actually have a partnership with OpenAI. So talk to us about the competitive or frenemy situation you have with Microsoft and OpenAI's partnership. Well, we really believe in customer choice, and it's also very early in the LLM, in the large language model, Game. So it's too soon to call a winner. And so the way that we've built our Einstein One platform is we, we it's an open architecture. And so customers can choose their favorite LLM, whether it's one of our own Salesforce homegrown domain specific LLMs like Flowgen and Cogen, or it's from one of our trusted model partners, including Google, Anthropic, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, OpenAI, and then customers can also bring their own model. So it's really, really about adding value on top. It's our Einstein trust layer, providing data security, data privacy, um, zero retention prompts to ensure that none of the context that gets put into a prompt is ever stored or learned by a model, whether that's ours or a third party model. It's providing an audit trail, citations, and really that, that trust that customers need as a price of admission for AI in the enterprise. Clara, media reports suggest that, that the Informatica talks have broken down with Salesforce. Maybe Salesforce is back on the hunt, you know, from an M&A perspective. You lead the AI teams at Salesforce. How are you thinking about using acquisitions to build out your AI offering? Now, I'm not able to comment on, on that, but what I can say is that we're seeing phenomenal explosive growth in our Salesforce data cloud. And, and what that does is it allows customers to bring together all of their trapped silo data from across the enterprise. You think about, you know, for any business of, of even a small business has multiple different systems, multiple databases, data warehouses, and data lakes. And now we're able to connect that data in a, in a seamless manner. And if a customer is using um, a Snowflake or an, a Microsoft Fabric or an Amazon, a Google, BigQuery, they're able to bring all of that data, harmonize it, cleanse it, and activate that for use um, by all of their sales service, marketing, and merchant teams. Salesforce AI CEO, Clara Shee, great to have you back on the program. Thank you. Let's get back to the breaking news from the United Kingdom. The BBC is reporting that Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is currently informing his cabinet of his intention to hold a general election on July 4th and that Parliament will be dissolved next week. Of course, when the Parliament is dissolved, it's the official term we use for the end of a parliament and legally a general election must follow. The pound in the currency markets relatively stable following all these headlines. In the bond markets, gilts also steady. The expectation, you're looking at a live shot of number 10 Downing Street, many media outlets reporting that we will get a statement from Prime Minister Rishi Sunak of the Conservative Party uh, at some point today. Stay with us, we will have all of the latest. This is Bloomberg Technology. Scale AI, a startup that helps top tech companies improve data used to build AI products, is raising $1 billion in one of the largest financing deals of the year. The funding round now values the company at nearly $14 billion. Joining us is Alexander Wang, Scale's founder and CEO. And I look at the new investors, um, the venture arms of AMD, Intel, Cisco's in there, Amazon. What does that tell me? That's very interesting, the sort of strategic backing you've got beyond just the size and scope of the round. First of all, thanks for having me. Um, I think one of the key things uh, of our role in the AI industry is that we really are an infrastructure provider. The three pillars of AI ultimately are data, compute, and algorithms. Folks like OpenAI uh, solve the algorithmic piece, folks like NVIDIA solve the compute piece, and our role at scale is to solve the data pillar for AI. Our data foundry today powers nearly every leading large language model, including those from OpenAI, Meta, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. And so ultimately, one of our goals with this uh, financing round was really to ensure that we can continue serving the entire AI ecosystem. So when you look at a lot of the uh, strategic and corporate investors that we brought on board, it really was to sort of bring together the entire ecosystem at multiple layers of the stack. So this includes other folks in the 
kind of infrastructure layer, folks like NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, as well as folks in the model layer, folks like Amazon or Meta. And then lastly, folks at the application layer, folks like Cisco or ServiceNow. And so our, our goal ultimately was to ensure that we can continue serving the entirety of the AI ecosystem as a low-level infrastructure provider by, uh, by sort of like bringing together that entire, that entire cohort. What about Google or Microsoft? Are they interested? Is that for the later dates? Or can we only go with a certain number of each player in each system? Uh, you know, it's always uh, it's always like herding cats uh, with these with these uh, with these corporations. But we're you know uh, our goal is to continue serving the entire ecosystem. Um, we want to ensure that artificial intelligence on the whole is able to uh, is able to accomplish uh, the incredible potential. Uh, you know, our data engine. Our goal with our data engine is to generate all the frontier data needed to fuel us to AGI and potentially even beyond. You know, our view, one of the ways we think about it is, what are all the problems in data that need to be solved to get us from GPT-4 to GPT-10? And how do we ensure that we have the means of production to do all that? And let's talk about the means of production, about the action of labeling such data, because I know that you've really been thinking a lot about AI safety, the development, the, the biases, ensuring that that's something that's thought about within your business and those that you serve. But there was a lot of concern back in 2023 about who you employ to label data, and a lot of that work being done in the so-called Global South, how you're paying them, at what rate you're paying them. How is that being solved now by technology, Alexander? Yeah, ultimately, you know, we believe that the future of AI data rests on three principles, um, data abundance, frontier data, and measurement and evaluation. In terms of abundance, I mean, I think this is one of the, the clearer areas. Uh, we need to ensure that we are able to build a data foundry that offers in uh, an era of data abundance. You know, these models are becoming increasingly data hungry due to the scaling laws. Uh, every successive generation of models requires exponentially more data. And we need to ensure that we are able to build uh, the, the systems and the means of production that, that allow us to not resign ourselves to data scarcity. Um, a lot of the key for us comes into the second bullet point, though, frontier data. As we develop progressively more and more powerful AI systems, we need to be building frontier data, which is always pushing the boundaries of AI capabilities towards you know, uh, more advanced areas such as complex reasoning, agents, multimodality, multilinguality, right. and more. This, pro this production of frontier data requires human experts all around the world. And so you know, our view is that, that humans and expertise are a critical component of this production process. Alex, I remember August 2019. You were on a previous iteration of this show. You were 22 years old, and you'd just done a $100 million Series C. Fast forward to today, you've just announced a European HQ in London. You're valued at $14 billion. What's that like? How do you feel? Uh, you know, I think uh, ultimately the most gratifying uh, piece for me, and I think for the entire company, has really been how far AI has come in that time frame. You know, in 2019, uh, it was the very primordial early days of, of what's now called generative AI. You know, even on that program, we didn't talk at all about uh, about the exciting things that OpenAI or other companies were doing. We were talking about self-driving cars. If you fast forward to today, we've gone from GPT-2 to GPT-4 and beyond, or 4 and 4.0 and beyond. Um, we have uh, we have AI systems that are significantly more capable, and I think we see a path to AI really improving everyone's lives in a way that uh, was more of a pipe dream back in 2019. And so my hope is that you know five years later, if I'm back on the show, uh, that you know we can uh, we're looking back on the technology and seeing even further development in artificial intelligence, even further application of the technology, even further impact from uh, from ultimately what we view as the the most exciting technology of our time. I hope it's sooner than five years' time. Scale AI founder and CEO <laughs> Alexander Wang, thank you for joining us on the latest funding news. Meanwhile, we've got more funding news for you. And also in the world of artificial intelligence, DeepL announcing a $300 million investment today. That's a $2 billion valuation for the company that provides AI language solutions. And it's doing that to uh, more than 100,000 customers. Its CEO and founder, Jarek Kutilowski, joins us now. And Jarek, Tell us about DPL and what you're providing to your enterprise clients, because there's been a lot of excitement about the translation capabilities of the latest ChatGPT 4.0. How are you different? I think, and thank you for having me, I think it's amazing how 
translation actually is the first frontier at which AI has been excelling since since quite a few years. And, and DeepL has been founded in 2017. And we've been kind of researching on how this translation technology can be as reliable and accurate and on the point all of the time so that it suits the needs um, of the enterprises. It's it's really not about uh, kind of translating this menu in an um, in a restaurant where you where you're in a foreign country. Um, it's really about enabling companies uh, to just go and send the emails to their customers in their respective uh, languages of, of those which, which those are speaking and kind of really uh, going global um, as, as quickly as possible as they can with as much efficiency as, as possible. And so you have been managing to scale your business clients, your government clients with this offering. And I'm interested as to what therefore the new round of money will be doing. How will you be beefing up? Is it talent that you need right now? Is it marketing and getting other companies to know your story? Uh, I think it's, it's it's basically all of that. I mean, the company has been investing on all of those fronts. Uh, we are really... Uh, company that is investing very heavily on the research side. We are running our own models and has been have been doing so uh, since since the inception of the company. But at the same time, the type of customers that we're working with, uh, all of those enterprises that actually need this kind of technology, they need uh, to, they, we need to work with them. We need to enable them to to use this brand new AI uh, and and help them in, in, in doing so. And that's 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 a very large part of uh, of where our investments go to. Derek, what are the challenges with with building uh, language AI? You know, you, you're keen to underscore it's not just sort of simple translation, but it, it must mean training based on multiple data sets and, and calling on multiple data sets and the inference side. Just explain the challenge. Yeah, it's 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 first and foremost, it's all about the accuracy and the quality. I mean, you want to be sure and you want to be confident that whenever you're communicating, like the right point comes across. And it's and it's really not only about this accuracy itself, but it's also about the fluency of the of the language. You want to convince. Uh, you want to make sure that you're being understood as a professional. Uh, and for that, you don't only need models that are great at getting the facts right, but you also have to go beyond that and have all of that uh, language fluency in that. And that is then a mix really of the research uh, work that goes both on the data side, uh, that uh, goes into the algorithms, but also into the uh, feedback loop uh, and, and making sure that uh, that our human uh, editors, our translators um, are uh, assuring the quality of, of whatever comes out of the, of the AI models. You're joining us from Cologne, Germany. We've just shown a, a graphic with all of the customers that you have, thousands and thousands of them. Where are you growing fastest? Are you making money? What does growth look like? Yeah, we are we are a global company from the very beginning on, and I think that's 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 pretty understandable given given the product. Uh, it is it is really truly one of the one of the very international products out there, and uh, key markets for us are Germany, Japan, and the U.S. So it can't be more distributed than as, than that. Uh, but the U.S. is a, is a, is a pretty strong uh, foothold for us uh, right now. We've we've just opened an office um, a few months ago in in Austin, and and will be. Uh, working more and more with US companies that want to expand their footprint globally. Deep L CEO and founder Jarek Kotilowski, great to have you on the program here on Bloomberg Technology. Stay with us, we'll be right back. This is Bloomberg Technology. Yeah. Do you have a place in the AI PC market? Come back next year. There, there's yeah, exactly there are a bunch of bunch of NVIDIA GPUs and Dell PCs, uh, Dell workstations. Uh, all of our GPUs have the same tensor cores that are running in H100s in the cloud, and so every one of our GPUs use AI to do its work. AI, of course, is going to transform gaming. NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang being saved by his mate, Michael Dell. And I guess, Caro, the question is, move beyond data centers. When does NVIDIA get in the CPU game in PCs and go for Intel's market? That was just what I heard. <laughs> 
Come back next year to hear Ed, and I know you will be back there next year, but now we brace ourselves for what the earnings are like after the bell today. Then can they eclipse what the market wants to see, a more than 200% increase in revenue? We wait, we watch. We also anticipate a statement coming from UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak as soon as the next five minutes. Tune in, this is Bloomberg Technology.